Okay, so hello everyone. So my name is Jianan. I'm a, a faculty member in the School of Computer Science at SFU. Today I'm super excited to invite uh, Dr. Siham Amr Yahya to give a talk in our uh, data science series on transfers data science and AI. And uh, uh, Siham is a silver medal CNRS research director and she co-head uh, co of the Lab of the uh, Informatics of Grow Noble. She works on exploratory data analysis and fairness in job marketplaces. And before she joined the CNRIs, she was a principal, their, uh, principal scientist at QCRI, senior scientist at Yahoo Research, and a member of technical staff at at and Labs. Siham currently leads the SIGMOD and the VLDB Diversity Inclusion Initiative. So we are super excited to uh, invite her to give a talk uh, on this very, very interesting topic. And I will uh, play, so the, the, the whole talk will consist of two parts. I will first play the first part of the video and uh, I will stop and to check whether there's any question. And, uh, and after the QA part, I'm going to play the second part. Let me. Thank you, Jen Pei, and thank you for inviting me to uh, this webinar series. I'm really excited to be here and tell you about some of the work we've been doing on online job markets. My name is Siham and I'm a CNRS research director in Grenoble in France. So what are online job markets? They're web destinations where one finds work. They enable the posting of open calls to hire cheap, immediate, skilled and easily accessible labor online. We're going to be looking at two types of online job markets, crowdsourcing platforms, where work is in the form of micro tasks, usually completed by one worker, such as image labeling or sentiment recognition, or in the form of collaborative tasks that, in, that require collaboration between individuals, such as collaborative text editing or having people go out and take uh, pictures uh, of insects and plants for biodiversity. So the success of crowdsourcing platforms is mainly due to the fact that a lot of these uh, tasks and in particular micro tasks are much easier to get done by humans than by machines. The second type of uh, online job markets where going to be examining our freelancing marketplaces where work is in the form of micro gigs such as resume preparation or uh, hiring somebody to assemble or move furniture for you. The main characteristic of freelancing marketplaces is that they blur the boundary between virtual and uh, physical worlds. For instance, in the case of resume preparation, everything happens online. Recruiting a person and then getting the job done is all virtual while uh, hiring a plumber is really a mix between these two. So let's look at crowdsourcing. One of the main uh, goal of the tasks that are deployed on crowdsourcing platforms is to produce data. So crowdsourcing platforms are intermediaries between workers and requesters that post uh, micro tasks. And there's a number of them the oldest and uh, most popular is Amazon Mechanical Turk that has thousands of workers available at once. Then there is a number of others. A lot of them build on top of Amazon Mechanical Turk, such as Figure 8, which is the new incarnation of Crowdflower. And Figure 8 mainly focuses on generating labeled data. In Europe, in the UK in particular, there is Prolific Academic that is very good at profiling workers uh, based on first gathering their demographics information and a number of other information describing workers for better targeting. And also a number of other platforms such as the academic Crowd4U platform developed in Japan. Here's an example of a uh, of crowdsourcing uh, platform that is available at the New York Public Lab Library. Uh, so that was launched uh, about 15 years ago 
to build the cultural heritage of New York City. So one can see in the bottom right that uh, people are invited to uh, produce uh, audio that describes their, um, re their experience in their neighborhood. This is one task. And then on top of that, another task is deployed where the audio is transcribed into text and people are invited to come and uh, edit the text and fix errors and so on. Here's another example of a, uh, a task that is very common on uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk where people are invited to uh, generate structured data that describes the content of a receipt. And one can clearly see that this is about uh, labeling an image and uh, can serve a, um, to train a, uh, a learning algorithm to do that automatically. So as for freelancing marketplaces, same picture, we have workers, we have requesters the, who post micro gigs and a number of platforms out there such as TaskRabbit in the US, Kappa in France, and also the big giants, uh, Google and Facebook where uh, workers log in and um, get to see a ranked list of jobs. Here's an example of a screenshot from TaskRabbit where you get to see a number of uh, job types that one could apply for or that one could provide as a requester. So what's our vision? So the current view of online uh, labor markets tends to see humans as uh, low level agents in the service of broader AI goals, in particular, you know, data production for AI. And what our vision is, is that future of work should be a place where humans are empowered with the ability to get help from a mix of humans and machines, enhance their capabilities through skill acquisition and most importantly, feel safe. This was the topic of a DAX tool workshop that I co-organized last year. So while data science cares about data and insights, humans actually care about a lot of other things that are quite different. They care about how they're treated, they care about how they're doing, they care about how they feel and what they're learning. And this is going to be the outline of my talk. I'm gonna first talk about fairness on freelancing marketplaces. This is joint work with Shadi at the American University in Beirut. So let's start with the definition. So I can define disparity or unfairness in online job markets as the unbalanced targeting of workers based on their protected attributes. The French criminal law, for instance, lists 23 such attributes gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation. So by means of this definition, I'm going to be focusing on group fairness. In other terms, I'm going to be looking at groups of individuals that are described by a combination of these protected attributes and examining if they're treated similarly or differently. So let's take the example of Kappa, which is a uh, freelancing marketplace here in Grenoble, where you can go ahead and uh, look for people, for instance, to design a website for you. In addition to that, on the left panel, one could set uh, some additional conditions for the query, such as years of experience and um, level of study or diploma. And what the system does is provide a ranking of uh, people to hire as a web designer. So here there is close to 3000 people who are ranked. So behind that, there is an algorithm that does the matching and uh, decides to uh, rank people based on how well they fit the search query. So we can uh, look at that as as input, what we have is a query, a job search, and a set of workers, and as output, a ranking of those workers according to some uh, scoring function, such as the one I'm showing here in the bottom. But um, one can assume that there is a, uh, a ranking 
um, sort of a handcrafted ranking for uh, each uh, job type. And uh, what I'm showing here is a, uh, an example of a, a set of workers where uh, each line we can see a worker described by a uh, combination of protected attributes and inferred attributes. And one can also see that the scoring function is expressed as a function only on inferred attributes such as years of experience, uh, some test results, an approval rating that is assigned to workers by the, um, by eventually by requesters or uh, by uh, the platform, and a scoring function that computes how uh, fit each worker is to um, the job. Now let's look at this uh, slightly differently. So I'm gonna look at the set of workers and the scores that are assigned to them as a, uh, an organized them in a tree. So at the root of the tree, I can see all the workers with all the scores that have been computed for them. Uh, and I have a histogram that uh, summarizes these scores, so the number of workers that have received these values of uh, scores. And then I can also uh, imagine that I have a space that is produced by uh, partitioning my workers based on their protected attributes. For instance, at the first level, I'm gonna see males and females, and of course, males and females will have a, uh, a different uh, distribution of scores represented by their histograms. So if I need to compare uh, how the uh, scoring, the ranking, treats males and females, which are two comparable groups, I uh, need to define a distance function between the uh, histograms or the score distributions that they have received. And I can do that at any level or any group I can define. <clears throat> so based on this representation, I'm going to define one possible problem in this space, which is the most unfair partitioning problem that takes a set of workers, a scoring function, and looks for a partitioning that exhibits the uh, highest uh, unfairness, right? Or the highest discrimination, if you will. So this partitioning is obtained by looking at, by considering all um, protected attributes and uh, breaking down the space of all workers into groups and comparing uh, comparable uh, groups at each level by computing the uh, EMD, the earth movers distance, which is one measure of uh, distance between uh, score distributions and averaging that overall for all the partitioning. And so by solving this problem, it's going to be uh, finding a partitioning of workers that exhibits the highest unfairness for a given query, a given job search query or a given scoring function. So using that, we ran a set of experiments, in this case uh, on TaskRabbit, where we consider the 20 most popular job, uh, jobs in 45 US cities and uh, launched the, these jobs there are 287 such jobs, such as home cleaning, for which we obtained uh, ranks, uh, rankings of workers and considered the top 50 uh, rankings, the top 50 workers per query. And then uh, we uh, took each uh, worker and used the picture, crowdsourced the picture of a worker to uh, assign gender and ethnicity. So each picture was crowdsourced to three uh, workers and uh, to infer the gender of ethnicity and ethnicity of each worker. And then we ran our algorithm, the most unfair partitioning problem, for each one of these queries to determine uh, which uh, partitioning or which groups, uh, which protected attributes identify the exhibit the highest uh, discrimination for each query. So one, uh, one result here shows that out of the 287 queries, 112 of them exhibited the highest uh, unfairness or discrimination uh, based on a partitioning on ethnicity. 
which is defined by three values, white, black, and Asian. 89 of them had the highest and fairness uh, based on a partitioning on gender, male and female, and the rest on a combination of male and female. So what we can also observe by examining the, uh, more carefully the uh, 112 uh, queries is that they all returned white taskers in their top 50. And if we look at the uh, uh, distribution, the pie chart uh, in the bottom left, that shows the breakdown of the overall population based on ethnicity, we can see that this result is compatible with the underlying data distributions. But for the 89 queries that exhibited the highest discrimination based on gender, 83% of them uh, had uh, males in their top 50, which is even higher than the underlying um, statistics of males and females in the uh, whole population. So what this is doing is simply uh, trying to put into perspective the results that we found uh, with respect to the underlying uh, data distributions. We could be a first step a first step toward uh, trying to uh, interpret or understand why we're seeing uh, such a disparity. So another view of this is to look at uh, what, are the, what are the most discriminatory uh, jobs and what are the least discriminatory. So for instance, moving and handyman are the most discriminatory and event staffing is the least discriminatory. This can also be viewed from the perspective of cities. What are the cities uh, that are most discriminatory versus the least discriminatory? So in an effort to generalize this, uh, this first uh, approach to the problem of fairness on uh, freelancing marketplaces, we're going to be uh, assuming that on any given site, we can consider, we can build any number of groups uh, that are obtained by a combination of protected attributes that would be considered considering a set of job related queries and a set of locations. So for instance, the jobs are uh, home cleaning or logo design. And now we can uh, define the uh, discrimination value of a triple group, query and location as a, the average of uh, pairwise uh, distances between a group and its variants, pairwise score distances between a group and its variants. Okay. So for instance, the variant of the group black females would be black males, Asian females, and white females that are obtained by modifying one protected attribute value at a time. And so with that, we can uh, compute the discrimination of black females by contrasting its score distribution against uh, its uh, variant groups. For instance, on TaskRabbit, if we consider the score distribution of black females, we can compute the difference between the score distribution of this group and all its variants and uh, compute the average of these uh, differences and assign that as the discrimination value that is uh, for black females for a given uh, query or job search at a given location. In fact, we can also do that on Google job search. So the difference is that on Google job search, uh, people see ranked lists of jobs as opposed to uh, having ranked list of workers. But what we can do uh, is to look at the ranked list of jobs obtained by each individual in the black females group and compare, for instance, using a jacquard uh, distance, compare those lists with their counterparts, meaning with members of comparable groups, and uh, average all that to compute the discrimination value assigned to black females on Google job search. So this allows us to define a number uh, of, uh, solve a number of problems 
by aggregating individual group query location uh, discrimination values. We can, for instance, look to find uh, which two groups TaskRabbit is the most unfair for, regardless of, I mean, across all job search queries and across all locations, or we could do it for a particular job uh, or a particular location. We can also look at what we call query fairness. For instance, what are the five least discriminating jobs for Asian males at all locations? And we can also look for location fairness out of a number of locations. What is the least discriminating location for women looking for an event staffing job? So these problems, in fact, uh, can be solved by leveraging top K processing algorithms that are efficient algorithms to prune unnecessary results and find either the top K groups, the top K jobs, or the top K locations. Let me tell you about the experimental uh, setup because I think in, these, uh, in this space, it's, it's important to understand how the uh, experiments are conducted, how the data collection happens uh, to better interpret the results. So on TaskRabbit, uh, for a period of three months, we um, extracted uh, all the jobs offered in 56 uh, cities. And that, was, uh, that resulted in uh, 5,300 query location pairs and um, 3,300 workers that were ranked for these uh, queries and locations. So we uh, received that data in a first step what we did is extracted the uh, photos of uh, workers. We ran them through Amazon Mechanical Turk to uh, determine the gender or an ethnicity of individual workers. And then we uh, ran the uh, query results for each query through our discrimination estimation for each group query location. Uh, triple, and we computed the unfairness scores or discrimination scores for each triple. On uh, Google Job Search, we proceeded slightly differently. Remember that on Google Job Search, it's the jobs that are ranked and not the people. So what we did is we took the uh, top 10 and bottom 10 TaskRabbit uh, group query locations. We use the Google Keyword Planner to uh, find all the keywords that correspond to the job search on TaskRabbit. And then on one hand, in phase two, we went to prolific academic and hired uh, groups of workers whose uh, demographics matched our group descriptions, the one obtained from TaskRabbit. And uh, Prolific Academic is very good for that because you can target uh, the hiring of workers based on uh, their demographics. And we asked those workers to install a Google Chrome extension that we developed and uh, whose purpose is to, to run uh, a number of queries uh, on Google job search and scrape the results. And then we use the results uh, to compute the discrimination of every group query location. So here are some uh, results on TaskRabbit. So this shows uh, the results of estimating or computing the uh, discrimination value of uh, individual groups. So one can see that using uh, EMD as a comparison measure, uh, Asian females are the most discriminated against all the way to white males across all locations and all jobs. We also use another definition of, um, of discrimination, which is called exposure. And uh, we can see that the results are, um, are, are largely compatible. Similarly, one could also ask for the most discriminatory uh, jobs at all locations for all groups and also do that 
uh, for cities. We can also uh, do comparisons. So here what I'm showing is uh, that overall for males and females, these are the discrimination values. So females are more discriminated against than males overall on TaskRabbit, regardless of uh, jobs and uh, locations. And that this trend is inverted uh, when we look at specific cities. I can do that for jobs. These are the, these, between uh, these two jobs, uh, this is their comparison. But for a particular uh, demographics group, this comparison uh, changes. And similarly, I can do that uh, for locations. Given any two locations, I can uh, uh, tell you what is, um, which one is more discriminatory than the other and uh, for which jobs this uh, trend changes. <clears throat> of course, all these different comparisons can be combined in, uh, in any way we want. Uh, and uh, provided at a fine-grained level of group square location or aggregated uh, level along any one of these three dimensions. So the summary, the summary of fairness is that I've shown you that one can develop a framework to quantify discrimination in ranking on uh, freelancing uh, marketplaces. This framework, in fact, can be developed for workers who are uh, looking to find uh, jobs uh, for which uh, there are uh, the uh, least likely to be discriminated against, for instance. They can be um, used by requesters to uh, deploy uh, jobs uh, at locations that uh, discriminate the least, for instance. But more generally, by platform designers uh, to uh, provide um, platforms uh, on which one can uh, quantify the level of discrimination and potentially even use such tools uh, to uh, label a platform um, according to some, uh, uh, to some expectation in terms of um, fairness. Our framework accommodates a number of fairness measures. It also accommodates different optimization formulations along the group, query, and location um, dimensions. There are many open questions. Uh, one that um, I think is extremely important is to package uh, such solutions into tools uh, to make them easily usable. But also uh, there is the question of uh, in addition to quantifying uh, discrimination, there is the question of explaining it or attempting to repair it, uh, and uh, some existing work already uh, is being developed uh, in that direction. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop here for this first part of the talk. Take any questions you may have before resuming and presenting the second part. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Heath. See how this is so interesting. So is there any question uh, from the audience on the first part of the talk? So you can either uh, type your question in the chat box or you can raise your hand. Uh, maybe I can start with one question. So um, if I, we find uh, two groups that are um, discrimination of uh, unfair, uh, is there any way we can quantitatively uh, compare the two groups? Because they are, we, for in those situations, uh, uh, we are comparing uh, apple and orange. Absolutely, we can fall in a situation where we're comparing apples and oranges. The first thing to ask is, what are they discrim discriminated, you know, how did we quantify the discrimination, right? So the first thing is, uh, are these groups discriminated against overall, like across all queries and all locations, or is it in a particular location, right? And that's why we thought about this question of, uh, you know, we need to be able to easily break down the values that we observe uh, by location or by, by job or by job type, right? Uh, 
And uh, clearly, you know, we're, we face things like the Simpson paradox, right, in, in that situation, right? Where definitely, once you start breaking down things at the level of jobs or location, you may uh, end up with uh, different observations. So that's one, uh, one aspect. The second thing is there is the underlying data, data uh, distribution itself, right? I mean, the same phenomenon happens, right? Uh, whatever you observe at the macro level may not hold, right, in terms of availability. I mean, it may just be that, you know, there aren't enough people in some uh, category of, in some demographics, right, who are qualified for a job, could be as simple as that, right? Um, and, the, and, and that is related also to the size of the groups themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, uh, I mean, in theory, you can also be comparing the group and some subgroup, right? So what would it mean to, uh, to, what does it even mean, right? To compare a group and its subgroup, right? So all of that, all of those things are things that we did not develop any further. In fact, we were trying to approach the problem in the simplest way, in the sense of having building blocks. Okay. Right? Can we? Uh, yes, absolutely. Can we? Can and also, you know, there is a dependence on the uh, the fairness measure, right? That you're using, right? Are you using an exposure measure, right? Is it simply based on you know the rankings of the uh, of the individuals, or is it or is it a question of just you know uh, stamping saying you know your quali people in this group are qualified, people in this group are not qualified. So we chose to treat it as a ranking problem simply because uh, these uh, platforms rank people or rank jobs. But could, you could also treat it even more simply as a classification problem, right? So I think what we, we need is really uh, a, a more uh, holistic way of quantifying uh, this notion of discrimination and then start asking the question of, can we, in, in a sense, your question is, can we explain anything, yeah. right? Can we, yeah. And, um, yeah, not yet, <laughs> I'd say. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So we have uh, one question from Yan Jie, and uh, uh, the question is, uh, so thanks Professor Yahya for the interesting talk. So usually my simulation shows me that the prediction accuracy had to do be sacrificed for fairness. Therefore, do we need to optimize accuracy by guarantee fairness? or optimize fairness by guarantee accuracy? Yeah, thank you, very good question. Um, so it's true, uh, fairness cannot be treated alone, right? So uh, it's something that I actually mentioned at the very end of, the, uh, of my presentation in the second part where um, you cannot get everything, right? I mean, ultimately in a ranking, for instance, there is only one position two and one position one and one position three. Okay, so uh, so so similarly for uh, for for the question right here about prediction accuracy versus fairness. When we're talking about fairness in the context of uh, recommendations or in the context of classification or um, so uh, yes, I think that the the uh, the answer to this is that. Um, once we settle on ways of quantifying fairness, then what we need is to actually solve, um, you know, bi-objective or multi-objective problems. If we want to design a system that complies to some fairness conditions, right, and complies to, to you know, complies with some, some uh, accuracy goal. So, and then just like any, you know, multi-objective problem, you can set constraint on some dimension, such as fairness, you know, you say this is the level that I would never, I should not go be below this level, right? There, uh, or you could do it on, other, uh, on, on the other dimensions and optimize for as much as you can uh, for fairness, right? Uh, or you can combine these into a single objective, you know, as a, uh, as a linear combination, uh, or go with, you know, more generic methods uh, that, you know, solve the problem in a multi-objective way. Okay, so we have another question from uh, Zizun. So, uh, dear Professor Siham, uh, and thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Could you please explain more about explaining discrimination? Are we trying to explain the discrimination caused by machine learning models or caused by society environment? 
Yeah, very good question too, thank you. So uh, yes, so explanation uh, of course has many different interpretations. The one that I'm aware of, most aware of, is uh, more from a, uh, from a, a, a computer science, uh, I mean, I, what you're saying, ML model, even though here is, it's, not, it's not a machine learning process, it's a ranking process, but the same thing would apply. Where um, I, I can tell you about one piece of work that I think I mentioned at the end of my uh, of, of this first part, where if the the what the problem is setting similar to ours, where you have a ranking function, right, with different dimensions that are used, different components of the ranking function, and uh, let's say that this ranking function is a is a weighted linear combination. So of course your weights are going to be you're going to have to make a choice of how you, how you assign weights to different dimensions. And so one, one framework for explanation is to vary those weights, right? And see, really, in fact, what you're looking for, right, uh, is, is the space of, you know, uh, different values of discriminations for a given group of, a given collection of groups, and how uh, they change as you're changing the, uh, you're weighing uh, different components of your scoring function differently. Okay? So this is one way of looking at the problem of explanation, which is purely, um, in a sense, procedural or purely, you know, there is some semantics in it that says, yes, of course, if you're giving this much weight to your, um, to your, um, uh, to the approval rating of workers, for instance, right? This is what you're getting in terms of uh, discrimination. By doing that, really, by, by navigating in that space, but trying to understand how, um, in fact, you know, uh, to un unveil some potentially latent correlations, right, between the ranking that is induced by uh, some scoring function and the protected attributes. Right? So scoring function, even if it's not expressed on protected attributes, it may end up, you know, uh, uh, sort of being um, the rankings that are obtained end up being, being uh, having some, some correlation with the protected attributes. So that's one way to look at the explanation, right? Which is from, and from the perspective of ML models, it would be the same thing, right? I mean, you could also be looking at what are the latent factors, right? That uh, yield some classification, um, result that itself yields some discrimination value. Okay. From a societal or an environment perspective, yeah, that's, we're going to leave that to the, <laughs> to the experts. <laughs> okay, so maybe I can uh, play the second part of the video. Okay, thanks. So in the second part of the presentation, I will talk about how people are doing, how they feel, and how they're learning. I will start with uh, skill and motivation. This is joint work with Senjuti from NJIT and Gautam from UTR LinkedIn. This is a screenshot from Amazon Mechanical Turk showing a ranked micro tasks, which is a common way for workers to discover uh, new tasks to complete. Usually workers uh, spend uh, quite a bit of time going through uh, these tasks uh, to figure out which ones best match their profile. So this is what uh, we could refer to as self-appointment to tasks. And al algorithmic task assignment is about uh, figuring out algorithmically or um, identifying which tasks are best suited uh, to uh, workers' profiles. So we're gonna look at a particular case of algorithmic task assignment for collaborative tasks. Our input is a set of collaborative tasks and a set of workers. And uh, as uh, output, we're expecting to form one team per task. The team would be collaborating to uh, complete the task. And our example task will, will be uh, collaborative editing, so inviting a team of workers to uh, write a piece of text together. We will consider that each task has uh, a budget, which is uh, the cost of the task or an upper bound on how much the requester is willing to pay, a required expertise, 
which for instance, in the case of audio transcription could be English comprehension and an expected outcome quality, which would be uh, the expected uh, quality of the um, individual crowd work uh, contributions uh, cumulated uh, into a, a single outcome for which the quality is measured. Each worker has a number of human factors. A worker has a, a skill that reflects uh, the ability of that worker to complete a task an expected payment, an expected wage, and an acceptance ratio, which is similar to an approval uh, rate that uh, a platform would compute based on the workers previously completed uh, tasks. So now we're going to formulate the problem of forming one team uh, per task by considering all these dimensions. So my problem is uh, going to be to maximize uh, the uh, outcome of uh, crowd work. So maximizing crowd work quality for a set of uh, tasks, big T, which is the sum of individual task uh, qualities, which is here simply expressed as a weighted linear combination of individual uh, task quality and uh, one minus the uh, payment. And I'm going to be uh, considering that the quality of a task is the accumulated skills of individuals who are uh, uh, involved in the task. Of course, other aggregations could be, uh, could be used. And for the wage, I'm going to be simply summing up the uh, payments for in to individual workers uh, in the same team. And optimizing this subject to uh, task quality constraint and also to the task budget or the task cost uh, constraint. This is a hard problem. Uh, it is um, similar to a uh, multi knapsack problem for which there exist approximation algorithms. So let's see how we did it in practice. So the experiments we ran uh, were on Amazon Mechanical Turk and they usually happen in three phases. The first phase is uh, when the workers are recruited uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, estimating or assessing their skills. We use the uh, questionnaires, uh, one questionnaire per, per task, uh, that uh, asked a number of, uh, of questions and aggregated the results of the workers and uh, then simply use that to assess their skills for a particular topic. The second phase is the actual uh, collaborative task where um, we ran our algorithm and uh, formed uh, one team per task. Here we have five tasks and the task is to write a piece of text together describing a topic so we have political unrest in Egypt or PlayStation games. The topics were chosen in such a way that workers would be agreeing or disagreeing, would be converging into a piece of text more or less quickly. And so we end up with 20 workers uh, per task after running our algorithm uh, subject to the constraints that we have. And then uh, once these workers have uh, come up with the uh, the piece of test describing a, uh, each topic, we would crowdsource again these uh, pieces of text to assess their quality. And the crowdsourcing is based on hiring new workers after uh, they've gone through also uh, phase one uh, to determine their ability to assess the quality of the text. They're shown the text that is described, uh, that is generated by uh, each team, and then asked to uh, assess it along a number of dimensions such as completeness and uh, grammar and so on, which are all dimensions that are used in uh, evaluating text. So here is an example of uh, some of our results. So you need to focus here on the um, dark sort of black uh, result, which is uh, the result that is obtained by letting workers self-appoint themselves to teams, so not running our uh, team formation algorithm. And uh, the blue line is uh, the text that is obtained 
by uh, forming our teams um, according to matching the skills and the wages and um, the expected quality. So clearly, in both pictures, uh, the blue line is superior to the, uh, to the black one. And it's even more so for uh, topics that are more controversial and that took, such as uh, Egypt political unrest, and that took longer to, uh, it took longer to the team to deliver. Uh, so, you know, based on this, one can say that uh, optimizing team formation based on uh, skills and, 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 and cost is a good uh, way to uh, obtain or generate uh, superior uh, crowd work quality uh, to letting workers self-appoint themselves to tasks. So this is the uh, good news. The bad news is that in some cases, uh, outcome quality was, was very low. So initially we uh, let the workers work together for 48 hours. Then we extended that period to 72 hours. But still, there were conflicting opinions, workers deleting each other's uh, contributions, uh, edit wars, just like in uh, Wikipedia. So it took us some time until we figured out that this was uh, probably due uh, to the fact that our teams were formed based on uh, optimizing for skill and cost, but uh, we did not account for what's referred to in the social sciences and in particular in psychology of work as group level human factors, which in this case uh, for collaborative editing are affinity and critical mass. So team formation in fact has been uh, studied quite extensively in the social sciences and by to, uh, on, on smaller scales than uh, what we're considering here algorithmically. But uh, the most important aspect here are that not only one needs to account for skill and cost in forming teams, but also for affinity between individuals, meaning you know, the likelihood that they would agree with each other, um, and for critical mass, which is the size of the team. So in uh, taking into consideration these additional features, we uh, reformulated our team formation problem to account for affinity and critical mass, and developed an instance optimal exact algorithm and a two approximation algorithm when the affinity distance metric uh, is a metric, when the affinity distance is a uh, satisfied triangular inequality. And for uh, that, we uh, developed a two-stage algorithm where we first form a team that maximizes the intra-affinity, so affinity within each group and satisfies skill and cost. And in the second stage, we decompose it into smaller teams to satisfy critical mass and by maximizing also inter-affinity uh, uh, between uh, teams. So each task, each collaborative task, uh, may uh, at the end end up being um, completed by several uh, teams that satisfy uh, scale, cost, affinity, and critical mass. So here is uh, here are some experimental results. So in this case, the uh, task that I'm showing here is a translation task uh, where um, a number of workers were um, hired following the same process as earlier, phase one, two, and three. And where the notion of affinity was based on um, regions or so people uh, in the same region or people in the same age group or people in the same gender. So the first observation uh, in the bottom uh, left uh, is that we um, obtain higher quality outcomes by accounting for affinity. So this is a comparison between uh, forming teams without uh, considering affinity and critical mass and forming teams uh, by considering affinity and critical mass. So we're clearly seeing here that the outcome is uh, higher quality, at least along the correctness and completeness uh, dimensions of, it, of the text. In the bottom right, we also see what the role of uh, critical mass uh, here, uh, which is showing that teams of size seven uh, are uh, superior or produce higher quality uh, translations 
uh, than uh, teams of smaller or larger size. Okay, so uh, now let's move on to motivation. Uh, so motivation is uh, on, on uh, crowdsourcing platforms has been uh, studied empirically uh, quite a bit and in particular in this piece of work where uh, a large scale experiment was conducted where workers were given uh, the choice to choose from a large number of micro tasks and uh, left to self appoint themselves to those tasks. And then they were asked a number of questions, like a series of questionnaires to uh, understand what were uh, their motivation uh, dimensions or motivation factors uh, in picking uh, those micro tasks, in choosing some, some micro tasks rather than others. And here we can see a breakdown of different motivation factors. So the bottom uh, ones uh, all the way up to the um, payoff or payment are extrinsic motivations, while the uh, enjoyment-based motivation are uh, intrinsic motivations, are considered intrinsic motivations. So we, on a scale uh, from zero to three, we can see here that payment is the highest motivation, but the collective, the aggregated uh, motivations of enjoyment-based uh, dimensions, such as, for instance, the variety of skills be required to complete the tasks that were picked, uh, or the feedback that the um, worker is receiving after completing a task played a role, uh, an important role in uh, choosing those tasks. So what we decided to do is to say, okay, let's consider two motivation factors and see how we can develop algorithms that account for these factors in assigning tasks to workers. So in particular, we uh, chose two motivation factors, the diversity of tasks, how different tasks are from each other, and an extrinsic factor that is the payment that is offered by the task. And we assume that each worker would be choosing out of a pool of tasks, would be choosing between these two factors, and we developed an iterative task assignment strategy where we show a number of micro tasks to workers, let them choose out of those tasks, let them complete those tasks, and meanwhile run a linear regression that learns the weight of diversity and payment and determine that the motivation of the worker is a weighted linear combination between these two dimensions so that in the next iteration, we would choose tasks that maximize this combination, so that maximize workers' motivation. We run a number of experiments, and one important result here is that when we compare between optimizing for motivation, which is the red line here, optimizing for uh, diversity only, so not accounting for payment and simply showing to workers in the following iteration, the most diverse set of tasks. And then when optimizing for relevance only, meaning how uh, well the tasks match the worker's skill, we observe that motivation provides the best worker retention, meaning that the workers uh, stay longer in the system when they are shown, when they are uh, recommended, in fact, micro tasks that optimize their, for their motivation. And then uh, diversity comes next and finally relevance. This is an important result because what it's saying is that uh, simply optimizing for how well the tasks match a worker's profile, which is the green line here, while it provides the highest quality outcome which was the case also in these experiments. It uh, uh, has the lowest worker retention, meaning uh, that workers are, stay around in the system the uh, shortest. So this calls for uh, considering you know, worker-centric uh, factors 
you know, such as motivation. All right, so the summary so far is that human factors you know, must dictate algorithm design, that they should be observed during uh, task completion, and that skill, affinity, critical mass uh, yielded uh, higher quality contributions in team formation, and that motivation itself yields better worker retention. Okay, so now we can move on to the uh, last bit of the presentation, which is uh, humans caring about what they're learning. And in particular, we're going to look at uh, team formation. So we're going back to collaborative tasks. And the uh, goal here is going to be looking at how uh, peer learning occurs within teams when the teams are formed according to the affinity between individuals. This is joint work between Payam and Senjuti from NJIT, and Payam is joining my team uh, early 2021. All right. So in this work, what did we do? We asked ourselves the following question. We wanted to understand if we could capture how well workers learn from each other when completing tasks, and in particular, how uh, affinity and learning potential, uh, the interplay between these two occurs. So we first formalize learning potential. We formalized affinity structures in a team, and we developed algorithms with provable theoretical guarantees to assign a, a team uh, to a task while accounting for affinity and learning potential. Let me give you first a definition of learning potential and affinity structures. So learning potential can be seen in many ways. One assumption on the left-hand side here is that every, in a team, every member learns from higher skilled members. Another assumption is that we only focus on the least skilled and the most skilled member, okay? That the learning potential of a team of uh, one, two, three, four, five people is uh, computed as the uh, learning potential of the uh, least skilled member from the most skilled member. Now, every edge here is computed simply as a difference in skills and the learning potential of a team is the aggregation of all the edges in that team. So these would be the two definitions of learning potential. For affinity, we can also look at the dynamics in the team and define affinity in the first case as a function between all pairs of its members, or define it as a function between one member who would be considered as a moderator and all others. Okay. Now, in terms of the definition of a single edge here, it could be based on uh, some dimension, some attributes of the uh, members, such as what we did earlier, uh, for instance, based on demographics information or based on any personality traits uh, that has been studied in the literature. So now that we have these two definitions for learning potential and two definitions for affinity, we can start thinking about tasks and how to uh, optimize for these two dimensions to deploy them. I'm going to take this example task, which is going to be a fact-checking task about the British royal family. So it's a series of questions that are going to be asked to uh, a team of individuals. And I'm showing here two example questions that were deployed. And uh, for instance, in the first question where the members are asked if the queen needs a passport to travel, uh, workers you can see uh, can be uh, quite verbose in their answers. I mean, the answer here is either true or false, but you can see that worker one says true, all British passports are issued in the name of Her Majesty, the queen, and worker two, you know, says that um, there's an article which agrees with, uh, with the findings of worker one and additional information that worker two is volunteering. 
So we can see that there is a dynamics between uh, these workers and a conversation that, uh, that happens through which we expect that uh, there is a learning uh, that takes place, okay? So the way we uh, deploy these, uh, these tasks is by first, uh, again, multi-phase deployment, where we first recruit workers uh, and uh, assess their skills based on a series of questions on the British royal family. Once their skills are assessed, we form the teams and then we do a post assessment to see if there is a difference between their uh, skills at the beginning before completing tasks and their skills at the end. So how do we form the teams? Well, one can formulate a bio-objective problem uh, to form the teams where we are optimizing both for learning potential and for affinity with the expectation that when we're uh, higher affinity teams uh, are more likely to uh, encourage uh, higher uh, learning, to encourage learning be, uh, between their members. And here, of course, we need to consider the two definitions of affinity and the two definition of learning potential that we have. So this is a bio-objective optimization problem. And it turns out if we look more carefully at learning potential, that the learning potential expressions, regardless of what, uh, one definition or the other, are polynomial time uh, solvable uh, because the primary operation that is involved in uh, optimizing learning potential is sorting, since it is based on looking at the difference of skills between every pair of members uh, or in one case, or between the least skilled and the high skilled member. So then what we do is we simplify our optimization and first solve learning potential optimally and then use that value of learning potential uh, as a constraint in a single objective optimization problem where we are optimizing for affinity. So just to give you a brief uh, idea of the uh, problems that we uh, define. It turns out we have four problems since we have two definitions of learning potential and two definitions for affinity. And we've developed uh, algorithms with provable uh, approximation guarantees for each one of these problems. So if I go back to my uh, fact uh, checking uh, task, one uh, result to, that we've, uh, we have here is that uh, combining learning potential and affinity yields uh, higher uh, learning. And so this shows uh, uh, one result of the experiments where we are comparing uh, teams, uh, the learning of individuals post task completion based on uh, their participation in teams that were formed simply by um, optimizing learning potential, this is the red bar, or by optimizing a combination of learning potential and affinity, which is the blue bar. So we can see that the um, individuals or the team members uh, have, are at least learn at least three times more than in the case of teams that are only formed by optimizing learning potential. Okay, so now we're getting to uh, close to the end. And uh, as a summary of everything, uh, I think we researchers have a big role to play in uh, the design of uh, online marketplaces. And in particular, in providing fairness assessment tools and in uh, helping workers find jobs that improve their skills and account for uh, factors such as affinity and motivation. Also existing platforms can or should rethink their design to empower humans and be at the frontier of future of work. This raises a number of open challenges in particular for fairness as we uh, said earlier, fairness quantification or fairness assessment needs to be uh, enriched and accompanied by uh, ex providing explanations and providing mechanisms for repairing uh, discrimination. Regarding learning, one uh, promising direction is to uh, examine 
different learning strategies from the social sciences uh, to help workers train for new jobs. In particular, uh, strategies such as scaffolding, where tasks are organized in um, increasing or alternating order of difficulty and assigned to workers to uh, help them improve their skills. So all of this hasn't been really studied algorithmically. And in putting it all together, one important aspect of all this is that we're talking about more than one dimension at once. We're talking about data-centric dimensions, such as optimizing for crowd work quality. We're talking about human-centric dimensions, such as learning, um, fairness, uh, and affinity between individuals. So enabling uh, developing frameworks within which more than one objective is optimized is necessary uh, to um, develop next generation uh, future of work platforms. In particular, in the case of uh, fairness, there is some recent work on what is referred to as multi-stakeholder fairness where uh, fairness is perceived not only from a worker perspective, but also from a uh, requester perspective, from a platform perspective, which of course uh, raises uh, new challenges. And uh, one other very important aspect is to aim for portability across platforms, and in particular portability of workers' credentials across the platforms. And this uh, can be enabled by building um, uh, backends or building uh, human data management systems that are enabled with machine learning algorithms to help workers better find uh, jobs, help requesters better uh, treat workers, and help uh, platforms in a holistic design that accounts for uh, all these dimensions. With that, I thank you for your attention and I'm ready for your questions. Hello again. <laughs> thank you. And uh, uh, please know that uh, you can not only ask questions for the second part of the video, but also for the first part of the video. So uh, let's see. Yes, Dujian, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Yeah, please. I'm assuming. Oh, hi. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Siham. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I have two questions. So first, uh, is I noticed that the notion of affinity was mentioned in uh, two different places. Uh, I've got the page number, but uh, uh, the I think uh, in the first. Uh, in one part that uh, we want to optimize, uh, we want to optimize on both affinity and uh, the critical mass. And uh, in, on second part is also uh, an optimization problem, but we have, uh, we give to uh, explicit definition for the affinity, the AFFC and the AFFD. I'm just wondering that if there are these two notions of affinity, uh, do they mean the same thing or you use different notion of affinity in different work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So uh, first, the notion of affinity only makes sense when you're talking about a team, right? And yeah. um, in the first problem, uh, we did not look at the affinity structure. We basically, well, actually, no, uh, that's not totally correct. We uh, considered affinity as uh, pairwise, just one, one definition out of the two that I had. And the first problem, we consider the affinity of a team is an aggregation of affinity between every pair of individuals, right? Now okay. let's, of course it means that you need to define this affinity, the pairwise affinity, right? So because we have a translation task and we, we actually really had a very simple understanding of affinity at the time with the translation task, we thought, okay, we will consider dimensions such as where do people uh, log in from? Uh, what is their age? What is their gender, right? When they're translating uh, text from one language to another, because we're assuming that they're gonna have higher affinity between each other if they come from the same region, right? And they will have more higher likelihood to kind of agree and converge 
toward the same translation, right? And, and the structure was fully pairwise. In the second piece of work, we said, okay, we could actually even look at a different way of aggregating affinity for a team. We could look at this pairwise, right? And, and combine every single pair of individuals to compute the affinity of a team. Or we could say that affinity in fact uh, can be uh, really based on, in, in, in a, like it's a star shaped, right? There is a moderator and there are people around. And, and people, in fact, affinity should be dictated by the communication model that you have, right? But this is what we assume, that in the second uh, model, we would say that there is one moderator and people really don't, everything goes through the moderator if there is an issue, if there is misunderstanding or if there is you know, disagreement. Right? And we looked at that structure of affinity. Okay, I see. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then, of course, you could say, you know, what are the attributes that are used to compute pairwise affinities? And there you could use, you know, as I said, demographics, but also things based on, uh, you know, those personality traits. The ex but I think it's very much dependent on the task at hand. What do you do? Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks. And my second question is more about the first piece, uh, the first work. Uh, uh, I, I remember that uh, the task is to optimize on both affinity and the critical mass simultaneously, yeah. right? But I have, uh, I, I have uh, the impression that the algorithm or the procedure uh, you mentioned is like a two-phase procedure. It's like you, you will first only look at the affinity and then you, you, and then in the second phase, you try to optimize on both affinity and the critical mass. So I'm wondering is it is due to a concern of uh, efficiency or uh, accuracy or something else? It's, it's, it's purely based on efficiency, right? Okay. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and 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 uh, you you know you can find more details in the, in the paper. But we basically by breaking down the problem into these two uh, two phases, we could actually design uh, better design uh, uh, algorithms with approximation, you know, with provable guarantees, and um, and, and better make use of the uh, property of the affinity uh, function, which in our case, in the first uh, type of problem that we looked at. Uh, uh, you know, satisfies, is a metric, right? So satisfies triangular inequality. So we could uh, better optimize for, um, in fact, we, 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 uh, we, we defined it more as a clustering problem, right? Where you're looking to optimize, to, you know, um, maximize affinity within clusters and minimize it across clusters. And, yeah. and we benefit, yeah. And it was, it was mainly due, uh, it, it was, Exactly, it was mainly due to um, to scalability uh, questions, and yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Dujin. And uh, we have a question from Mr. Sun. Uh, he said that uh, dear Professor C. M. Amar Yahya, so thank you for the talk. I have a question about task assignment. When assigning tasks to workers by algorithm, will the algorithm bring unfairness? into the system, for example, will some people always get high paid tasks? Yeah, very good question. <laughs> um, uh, that's, that's totally possible. <laughs> um, and especially in fact, um, and it's partly historically possible in the sense that um, the way research has gone around this, um, you know, sort of, the, Algorithmic, algorithmic crowdsourcing, if you, if you may, uh, has mainly focused on task assignment, right? Either for micro task assignment, team formation for collaborative tasks, and in fact, has mainly focused on data centric goals, right? Which are how do I find the, the, the right set of people to complete a job? And the right set of people goes after, you know, um, um, optimizing for the outcome. Like, like the quality of the outcome, meaning finding people who are uh, qualified, the most qualified to achieve a job, okay? So just that alone, in fact, what we observed is that that alone is not enough, right? So sometimes people are highly qualified, but they may not get along, 
right? And so you may end up having bad, you know, so that's when we introduce affinity. Yes, the next stage would be to consider, you know, things like fairness. Um, and, and again, I, I think, um, I'm not sure if, I guess that would need to at least be empirically um, checked as to whether a particular uh, way of assigning tasks to, uh, to workers is going to yield higher unfairness than letting them uh, self-appoint themselves to tasks, for instance, right? Um, but then one needs to be very careful in de designing that experiment because letting workers self-appoint themselves to tasks mean that they have access to a pool of tasks and that pool of tasks is usually ranked. So there is already a bias, right? In the way the tasks are presented to workers before they could even choose the tasks themselves. So I think that's why I think that there need to be really, uh, this is at the intersection of, you know, sort of adaptive kind of ML methods, you know, ML powered methods and, uh, you know, uh, just optimizations, discrete optimization or, because for instance, even for motivation, you know, if you say these are the motivation factors, you don't know what the right weights are and you need to watch people as they complete tasks. So I think for fairness, again, it's, it's a question of saying, enter this setting where workers are exposed to, to tasks in this manner, right? Like as a ranked list or as a pool or, or uh, through others, right? So uh, you know, there, there, there are uh, platforms where people hear about tasks, right? Um, so uh, under those conditions, I'm going to be uh, comparing between letting workers self-appoint themselves to tasks and some algorithm design or some objective function I'm optimizing for. So that's a very good, yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. Um, does task assignment, algorithmic uh, task assignment yield uh, some unfairness or introduce some bias is something that uh, is to be studied, yeah. Okay. Uh... So I actually have a one question. So, uh, so, so it's uh, quite interesting to see many study on the online uh, job marketing. So I'm just curious, uh, uh, what's the difference between the online job markets and the offline job markets? It seems like uh, some methodology you developed uh, in your work can also be applied to traditional job markets, like marrying the fair and fairness. That mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great point. Yeah. So, um, you know, earlier last year, uh, in uh, the French government launched a, um, an operation called Le Testing. And uh, that operation uh, was basically um, hiring people who would uh, draft fake resumes, right? And change only one characteristic in those resumes. Right between any two resumes, you say, you know, I live in this region, or I change my name, and then my name from the name, you know, people could say that you're North African of a North African descent, or your, or your, you know, whatever your 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 or French, whatever it is, whatever that means. So, um, so, and they ran it at a pretty large scale. Right, I uh, actually wrote a, a, a blog post on that. Uh, unfortunately, it's a French newspaper, so it had to be in French. So they ran it uh, at a very large scale, and they, you know, then they basically gathered all that data, data. So they had like teams of people sending out resumes and, and 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 gathering data, and then looking at it. And at the end, you know, saying you know that women have this many uh, chances, fewer chances to get a job than men. Uh, observing things like uh, if you have a name that kind of may people may uh, infer from that you're of North African descent, then you're you know, this many times less likely to get called for an interview, right, for a job. And then from there, there was, after, you know, the results were, came out, there was like this flurry of work where specific, um, uh, you know, um, sorry, um, organizations or let's say, for, for instance, a supermarket, like a big chain of supermarket, announced that they were going to run their own test, love testing, and then, and then another, um, another place announced that, and another place announced that. So what, what is happening? What's happening is that we need data, obviously, right, to first make assessments. And the difference, the difference between the physical world and the online 
world is that in the online world, we have that data, right? I mean, basically you, 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 can, you can just go and scrape it out and get it, right? Of course, there's a difference between, um, between being shown some jobs or being ranked at a certain position and going all the way to uh, doing the job or not, right? Converging in a way, the notion of conversion uh, here. Uh, uh, versus being, uh, versus like in the physical world where people actually get called or not for a job, right? So you're not measuring the same thing, right? By doing physical uh, and, and, and virtual um, uh, the marketplaces, uh, by watching these marketplaces. But I think one difference is that we have data, right? In the virtual world. The other difference is, um, is that it's extremely hard to regulate, right? These virtual worlds because it's a triptych, right? So you have platforms, uh, requesters, and workers, right? Today, most labor laws in the world uh, regulate a two-way relationship, right? And it's called the subordination relationship in labor laws. You've got the person who gives you a job and the person who's actually doing the job, and there's a contract, right? And that is exactly at the, that's at the core, of the, you know, of, every single labor law. And so regulating sort of this triptych is much harder, right? That's another aspect because some of the lawyers that I talk to, you know, say that it's, it's extremely hard, that they need such tools. They need to be able to assess, right? Uh, before they are able to regulate. Um, so um, yeah, so I think these are, these are the things. And the other thing is uh, when you look really at these, uh, at, at the core of what we're doing, we're looking at um, fairness discrimination on ra rankings, right? But maybe there are other ways people find jobs online, right? Um, and that's not something we're assessing. So there is, uh, you know, there's, I guess this is, this is more of a, um, you know, a positive aspect, which is there's more to be done in that space um, in, in the online world. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so any other question from the audience? So if not, so let's thank you, uh, Siham, for this great talk, and we actually learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks for the thank great Thank you, question. Siham. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you to all of you. Thank, thank you again for the invitation, and thank you to the attendees. Yeah. Thank you, have a nice evening. Mm. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.